The, thank you very much for the introduction. And here is the official title of the talk, which is Growth State Energy Estimation. But actually, I guess, I'm sorry, Tomaso, you misinterpreted each part of, uh, <laughs> of this one, because it's a bit difficult to, to uh, claim, and I, I will try to explain later. But first of all, it heavily uses dynamics, so it's even though related to ground state, this is, will be all about dynamics. Second, which is whenever I try to put a programmable quantum device, quantum software, whatever, people always say, oh, but then you must use some kind of a digital version or annealing. And here will be none. It will be a completely different approach. So yes, what can we do with quantum simulators? Can we actually write a software for quantum simulators. And the outline will be as follows. First, I will try to explain why actually we do it and what are the interesting problems and how is it done nowadays. And next, I will present a new type of algorithm, which I call quantum inverse iteration algorithm, which can give us ground state properties using the dynamics and will show that for specific examples in chemistry and material science. So first of all, quantum software. Of course, this, this is very important. Since we start to have hardware, uh, it's, uh, we have now full stack of quantum computing, which will include some hardware architecture, but also there will be a lot of software engineering to connect these two blocks. So to the programming languages, which also start to appear even before we have full-scale quantum computer. This is important that we also have uh, the means to program it. However, if we don't have good algorithms which run uh, efficiently, all these developments in programming and so software engineering will be meaningless. So I guess this is a good point, not only concentrate at the hardware, but also uh, think about very good software. And what are we going to do with this software? What are the perfect use cases for quantum computing? For instance, it can be quantum chemistry or material science. And the idea is that we want to find the matrix H which corresponds to the problem, so some molecule or material. And we want to find the ground state of this model. So if we talk about chemistry, usually we can write the Hamiltonian in terms of orbitals. So this will be interacting fermions with quadratic and with quartic terms. And in general, it will be all-to-all -all interactive models. Finally, if we met it to spins by Jordan Wigner or Brave Kitaev transformation, we will have the very uh, interacting Hamiltonian with spin strings. So what do we want next? We want to construct the circuit which will, first of all, find the ground state uh, of this Hamiltonian with low depths. We don't want overhead qubits. We want uh, it to be implementable with analog way. So this analog way, of course, it's something usually people don't add. But I do think that in near term, if you want to do something useful, we need to use analog uh, quantum simulation. And finally, we also want to be resistant to imperfection. So this is like a wish list, which is very difficult to achieve. What do we have now is quantum phase estimation, which satisfies certain criteria, but not others. Variational quantum algorithms, which are very popular right now. Different versions of annealing, including QAUA. And I would add one more uh, item in this list. So let's uh, go through the existing approaches. Quantum phase estimation relies on the following idea. We have some ancillary qubits, some ancillary system. We have control evolution of our system, and we measure the phase coming out of this evolution. And in general, it would be enough if we already have the uh, ground state, we can simply propagate it and measure the phase uh, with uh, high precision. If we want to do quantum phase estimation on not exactly the ground state, but close to eigenstate, we can do iterative protocols. So we can apply several times uh, 
control unitaries, but you can see this will be of increasing power and we need also to iterate it many times. So it's uh, good to know that it has polynomial scaling is uh, algorithmically, it's very good technique. However, it requires very heavy circuits. It's uh, multi-power unitaries which are controlled. Uh, we usually have large depths, so in near term it's unfortunately not possible, but yet it's state of the art, so at a certain point we will think about quantum phase estimation more. What do we have right now? It's actually a variational quantum eigensolver. And the idea is very simple. You start with some initial product state phi, and then you want to deform it with some circuit U with different control parameters which add entanglement and measure term by term the energy corresponding to this state phi. Later you will update the angles theta and go down to minimal energy. And there are different uh, ANSAT solutions how one can do it. For instance, in chemistry, unitary couple cluster ANSAT is popular. So the operators which you ap apply will contain different fermionic operators. So if you map it to spins, it will be something large. And it's not so uh, low depth still. If you add few terms like this and variate the angle, you have uh, possibility to go to the ground state. And the very first, uh, no, actually not first, but let's say the famous example by uh, molecular hydrogen by Google have shown that for this simple system, for two qubits, you can do it with single variational parameter and few gates. Okay, and that's very good, but how do you scale it up? People also show that you can uh, do it with larger number of uh, qubits and Recently, INQ, so just a few months ago, INQ shown it with 11 qubits for water. So yes, you can, in principle, scale everything up, but it's very difficult. Finally, what we have uh, is no extra qubits, so we don't have overhead. Uh, these circuits are relatively simple, although the scale is still small, and we can do error mitigation with these uh, techniques. What is the problem is if we go to larger system sizes, there will be a problem of variating everything. And although people try, there is no generally proven speed up for these techniques. So we don't know what, uh, what happens in the future. But I would say the variational techniques will be used even if we have uh, early fault tolerant devices. It just we need to really understand how we solve this scaling problem and uh, optimization. Finally, I just want to say that you can do it differently, not for chemistry, less, like a general purpose algorithm will be to variate the angle, some single qubit unit, or so something like we've seen yesterday, and also add entangling layer and repeat it many times. So this, for instance, was used by IBM with so-called hardware efficient setting, where entangling is just native entanglement of their gates. And it really allows to reduce uh, gate count and have nice convergence. However, here we don't really know if this uh, approach will be scalable in future. And what I'm trying to do right now with my collaborators from uh, actually a software engineering background is to improve this kind of schemes where instead of using all possible gates and entanglement, we do genetic algorithms and reinforcement learning to come up with better schemes so that we have uh, same fidelity, but we manage to reduce gate count three times. And thus we'll prepare better ground states. Finally, these techniques were applied by IBM, so these are now pretty much standard examples of molecular hydrogen, of lithium hydrate, and uh, beryllium hydrate. And recently, they also managed to push down the noise level by error mitigation and recover nicely the uh, energy landscape for these molecules. So actually not for beryllium hydrate. So you can see it's improving, but it took three years to actually to go to this level, and we don't know how, how fast the pace will be. <laughs> Finally, uh, if we speak about variational algorithms, we should actually relate it to another well-known technique, 
which is quantum annealing or adiabatic quantum computing. That's, uh, that's the original sense. So we start with some trivial ground state psi zero, and we want to go to the same ground state adiabatically of non-trivial Hamiltonian H1. And this now operates in continuous time, so we don't have digital errors and uh, doesn't require extra qubits. And what's important, we don't have variation, so we know in, at a certain point we will reach the ground state. However, the scaling with gap size, so if in the middle somewhere the gap will close, is very unfavorable. And it means if we have a first order phase transition, we might take exponentially long time to reach the ground state. And in general, there is no proven speed up unless you consider some specific Hamiltonian. Finally, we can also do digital version of annealing and, for instance, uh, make it error correction compatible by simply tertiarizing the evolution. But again, this uh, scaling with the gap size is persists and there is, again, no proven speed up. And you can think about other improvements, for instance, uh, the work I've been uh, doing is how do we do annealing and prepare ground states with Floquet simulation. So instead of implementing uh, Hamiltonian in analog way, we add some fast drive which changes qualitatively the form of the Hamiltonian, and we can also anneal to the ground state. So it allows for tunability and can be used right now. However, we again hit the same problem that in the end it will rely on annealing. And yeah, I, I would need uh, attention for showing something. So uh, think about uh, like this. You have a state from which you start, and then what you do when you act with this circuit or any unitary corresponding to an in, you just twist the state. You don't change the entropy, you basically just deform the state continuously. And, of course, if you come up with some very general unitary, you should be able to come from one to another. However, this is not it doesn't mean it's efficient. It doesn't mean that you can do it in polynomial time. You actually might do it exponentially, like people showing for uh, annealing. So whenever you do some unitary operation on the state, it might be difficult. Quantum phase estimation doesn't do it. Quantum phase estimation does control unitary on the system. So effectively, this is non-unitary operation, and it allows to change the scaling uh, dramatically. And now I want to propose the quantum universe iteration algorithm, which will be much closer to quantum phase estimation. So we'll not use uh, the variational approach or annealing, but hopefully can be done in the near term. And the idea comes really from classical algorithm of inverse power iteration. And let me explain how it works. So inverse, here we will need to apply a to minus one, uh, k times where a is some matrix, but I will show it, it's easier with power iteration. So if we take some matrix A and apply it, its case power to the eigenstate, we will simply get the eigenvalue to the power of k. And if we structure the, our eigenvector such that the lambda one is the dominant eigenvalue and apply the operation A to some initial state, which will include the ground state and all others, so the overlap is non zero, we will simply get lambda one, lambda two, lambda n as a prefactor, so we'll get the superposition of states. And if we apply it k times, now we will have it to a power of k, and if lambda one is larger than lambda two, at certain power k, everything will uh, else except for the dominant state will become um, zero. So if we renormalize it later, we will effectively prepare the uh, ground state. And this is how it's done classically. So there are different versions, but this will be the simplest one. And uh, last week I heard a lot about 
quantum inspired classical algorithms, uh, this is what people do. So here I, I will say it's classically inspired quantum algorithm because you can also, like we, we try to do quantum computing. So let's, let's come up with ideas where quantum computers are useful and I don't think it will be like entire protocol which is very uh, powerful that we don't need supercomputers, but if we manage to at least some subroutine of some specific protocols, if we manage to speed it up, that will be already great. Okay, so how do we apply it in a quantum uh, fashion? First of all, let's say that this inverse uh, matrix A minus one, we can connect it to Hamiltonian matrix H. And H to a minus one, can be actually represented in so-called uh, Fourier representation. So this will be the double integral, which will contain some functions, but what's very important, a complex exponent with a Hamiltonian matrix inside. And later we can also set it on the lattice, so we will have some sums. And again, this exponent. Here, when we slice it, we will have the First of all, uh, the n grid term and also the spacing between these grids. And the maximal uh, phase at which we need to propagate will be equal to the uh, MYMZ, so the maximal number of terms in the sum and the size of the step. So in my view, the maximal phase you need to propagate will be the measure resource in this system. Finally, we can also simplify it just to put down all prefactors is, as coefficients, and there will be unitary o operators. So now we rewrite uh, h to minus k as a sum of unitary operators. And this uh, decomposition, for instance, for uh, certain uh, matrices were used uh, to do linear algebra algorithms, like uh, Child, Scott, Harry, and Soma shown, and this can be done using Anstila based implementation. What I was thinking about is slightly different, is if we can apply it sequentially and hopefully do it in the near term. <coughs> so my work, uh, this one, is based on the sequential implementation, but I also know how to do the fault tolerant one. And if I quickly go through the slides, I'd, I don't think we need all the details, but the main idea is that what you need to do is prepare the, with some operation select, you need to prepare superposition of Anstila states and conditions on the state apply the unitaries. In this way, you will be able, hopefully in one, go to effectively act with matrix M, so this will be our uh, Hamiltonian on the state or inverse Hamiltonian, and if you don't succeed, you can apply it many times or do so-called amplitude amplification. And generally, it's very efficient technique, so I did some resource estimate. It uh, has the same scaling as phase estimation in terms of uh, error and number of steps. So yes, in future, we can use it for fault-tolerant quantum computation. And now, I guess, after yesterday's uh, everyone will think, okay, yes, you, you came up with algorithm, let's run it because we have quantum computer uh, now. And uh, unfortunately, not so fast. Uh, if we do the gate count for phase estimation, it will be far beyond uh, 1,400 gates which Google has shown. And we will also need much higher fidelity, so no, even if we have beautiful results uh, since yesterday, we cannot do any long uh, d depth algorithms. So we still need to uh, think about other approaches. So if we ask what can we do useful and do it right now, I would say we can still uh, do some simulation. For instance, if uh, I think about this sum of unitary operators, why do I need it? I actually need to estimate something about the system, not just uh, in platonic sense. 
I need to measure some observable. So let's measure the observable, which will be energy, and take the expectation value of the Hamiltonian over the state which is now evolved to be this inverse iteration. And now we also need to normalize it because I warn you, some of unitary operators is not a unitary itself. So we need to uh, account for normalization. And I go forward and actually rewrite it to see that we can start with initial state psi zero, formally evolve it with some uh, phases so there will be also many terms in, in this sum. And we will see that this is psi zero uh, with H operator and some time evolved phase uh, state. And also there will be norm of this uh, wave function, which will be some initial state times the propagated state. So essentially everything relies on the ability to evolve the state in time. And it will be heavily related to, actually it is just Loschmidt amplitude. So the possibility to start with initial state, evolve it in time and do some measurement actually gives you already a lot. It gives you information about ground state. And here the ability to perform dynamics is the main resource. And where can we do dynamics is actually with analog quantum simulator. So uh, Emmanuel Bloch, long time ago now actually, in, in, in this scale, has uh, shown that you can do something uh, with uh, analog simulation, which is very difficult classically. I wouldn't claim it's completely impossible. There will be, of course, uh, uh, counterclaims that no, we can do for one unit of JT more, but uh, at certain point it will stop. We know for sure. So the question is, if we can propagate our state for a long time, which is impossible to do uh, classically, then we certainly win with this algorithm. And uh, the results uh, from uh, Lukin's lab with 51 qubits are very encouraging. The trapped ions, so di different growths, but here the Chris Monroe 53 spins and measuring dynamical phase transitions, this is very relevant technique. So large system sizes, they manage to propagate for a long time the very inspiring example is Fermi Hubble model uh, simulator. So Markus Greiner shown that in 2D, Fermi Hubbard, which is extremely difficult to calculate classically, they managed to lower down the temperature just a bit to measure antiferromagnetic phase. And there is a huge space of phases below what one can do below reach pseudo gap phase and the coveted D wave superconductor. So for all these techniques, we need to lower the temperature and potentially reach ground state. And so far, it's uh, very difficult because uh, annealing adiabatic quantum computing doesn't work straightforwardly, especially in this complex Fermi Hubbard case. So what I will claim is that the, the fact that in these systems we can simulate the dynamics uh, in continuous time and later do some measurement can actually help to study the ground state properties of these uh, models. And let's recall again how this will be done. So for inverse iteration, we will need to prepare some initial state which has an overlap with the ground state. So the closer the better. We will rewrite the inverse Hamiltonian to the power of k as a sum of unitary operators and we know the prefactors and we only need to keep the phases or phase differences which are unique and do it one time. We will apply this operation to psi zero, but in reality what we only need to do is to later measure the observable. And here it's measured as a Hamiltonian expectation value, but it can be any other operator and estimate uh, these properties. So here there is no variation because you fix uh, the coefficients well before. It favors analog quantum simulation because, okay, if you do energy, uh, if you can propagate it uh, in continuous time, you certainly win. It doesn't have control uh, unitaries for, for uh, evolution and we don't need gate decomposition if we have the Hamiltonian. And also since it's for 
near-term devices, I also show that you can do error mitigation with this technique. Of course, there are caveats, and uh, uh, essentially, instead of uh, doing full quantum phase estimation, you need to do a lot of measurements. Yes, Philip? So my take is like this. If you have the Hamiltonian already, just uh, let it uh, propagate in time. So you start with something, and you don't need even to touch anything. Uh, you don't need to specifically design Hamiltonian unless you don't have it. If you don't have the Hamiltonian in, in physical system, if you want to construct it, this is uh, caveat number one. You need to uh, come up with H with structurization technique or any kind of technique. Suddenly it becomes expensive. I will show that you can still do it with uh, superconducting circuits for molecular hydrogen, but I wouldn't say it's very scalable. And if you need to torturize the dynamics, you, you can end up in the regime where you need fault tolerance, so then you just do quantum phase estimation or actually inverse iteration, uh, but fault tolerant version. So, Yes, if you need, if you don't have the dynamics, then it's expensive. But let's say uh, you already have Rydberg atom setup, and you don't know how to do gates separately, but you have some complex Hamiltonian. Just let it evolve in, in time and, and do some measurements. That's the idea. And measurement will be more complex because the overlap measurements, so low Schmidt amplitude, is actually is not a straightforward measurement, but that's the price you need to pay for uh, reaching the ground state physics. So, following up, how do we do the measurement? That was a, a big question to me, uh, and uh, it turns out to be very non-trivial, and one idea how, uh, how you can do it is actually if you have the reference state. So if you have the reference state, which is something uh, not evolving in time, and uh, it is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, so not the ground state, but some eigenstate, you can always measure the energy from that state. So the idea is that you can prepare the initial state and first measure not the amplitude, but the probability to remain in the ground state, which can be done in uh, many cases. And later you will need also to prepare superposition with the reference state of two types, and get the real part of the overlap, so something responsible for energy, as just combination of these three measurements. And then I tried it in different settings, and uh, yes, you can always uh, estimate this uh, R0 if you have the, the reference state. Finally, there are other methods, and people have been thinking about it for quite some long time. So starting from Horodetsky and Eckert, where they proposed a controlled swap on two registers, two data registered, or actually two states we want to overlap. Uh, recently, the River Lane quantum computing noted that it will correspond to the Bell uh, measurement for two states in the destructive manner. And they also used it to measure the overlap of wave function. Finally, just a uh, few weeks ago, uh, Bill Huggins and collaborators have shown that you can also do non-orthogonal variational quantum eigensolver. So the idea starts to develop in the same uh, direction as I, I pointed out, that instead of doing the unitary operations, they say, okay, let's do some circuits, but the compositions of these circuits and the propagated state will not be uh, normalized, so you need also to measure the overlap for these things. And finally, uh, my example and really motivation is this uh, work from Marcus Greiner's group where they show you can do many body interferometry. But they needed to measure entanglement entropy. So they need something more than just uh, typical observable or probability. How do they do it? They actually split the Hamiltonian, uh, the, the state in two, let evolve, and later they 
interfere it uh, together such that you have uh, some uh, combination. And this is very much related, first of all, to the uh, destructive swap test. So that's what it is. And also will be related if we prepare different uh, superpositions, will be easily implemented with this technique which I named. Finally, if we have this uh, overlap measurement, we can try and apply it to certain examples. And now the prominent example will be quantum chemistry, so let's just compare it with other systems. And I will start with molecular hydrogen, which is not a, an easy two-qubit case, but four-qubit implementation. Why do we need molecular hydrogen? That's actually the question I asked, and I found in the internet that it has the healing power and uh, it can be used for, for some therapeutics. Uh, okay, I'm not sure, but uh, certainly we need to use it because everyone will ask, what about molecular hydrogen? We can uh, take some existing package like open fermion, map it to uh, fermionic orbitals, and do jordan wigner transformation, so that will be the Hamiltonian. And here you can see the first two lines are ZZ terms, which commute uh, with each other, so easy to implement. The last line will be four body terms, which pairwise they commute with each other, but they don't commute with the first block. So essentially we have two blocks of this Hamiltonian. First of all, I can assume that I have access to dynamics of this Hamiltonian, that's the question of Philip, but if not, I will do tertiarization and show that it actually works. And now the measure parameter, as I motivated before, will be how many steps we need to slice, our, how many unitaries we need to take, and how long should we propagate. So this propagation time is essentially is set by the coherence, and of course if we say this maximal propagation time shall be very long, okay, it's very difficult to get uh, strict energy. But if we can propagate it in a unitary way and, and measure, yes, this will work. So these are the results for uh, iteration uh, for molecular hydrogen, and the red line is application of H2 minus one, which is ideal approximation. So let's say we do it until uh, infinitely many steps. And you can see already with two steps of iteration, we go down to chemical precision, and actually the convergence is very steep. Next we ask, what if we combine, uh, decompose H2 minus K into many unitaries? And it turns out that the very important part is maximal propagation phase. So if it's very small, we propagate our state just a bit, measure the overlap, but we don't actually get information about ground state. But if we increase it to meaningful values, we see that the convergence to ideal inverse iteration improves. So at certain point, and uh, large k, increased k, and increased phase, which we can also estimate how, how on average, which should it be, we can reach a ground state. I also use different metrics, which is how far away are two Hamiltonians. So this is only accessible in theory, not in experiment, but still important to understand. And the trace distance between ideal inverse uh, Hamiltonian and the, our approximation will, of course, depend on the maximal phase, so it shouldn't be uh, too small, and also on iteration steps. So the larger we go in iteration, the more difficult it is to approximate. Yet you can see that convergence of energy is not as bad. And there will be different dependence uh, on phase, depending on which iteration step uh, are you at. Finally, now let's ask the question, if we cannot have, uh, for molecular hydrogen, if we do not have the Hamiltonian in place, uh, how do we simulate it? We can do trotter, Suzuki trotter expansion, so slice it into few terms, and this M here will correspond to just two parts of the Hamiltonian. <coughs> We can see that with the trotter number, um, number of trotter steps already, with two steps, we can have fine convergence as long as the phase of propagation is not too small, which is essentially uh, say, saying that the trotter errors are not so important. And generally, I would 
say is that if we go to certain regime where number of throttle steps is not very small, so 2, 10 is not enough, but if we go to, let's say, 30, 40 throttle steps, even for larger system size, generally we can suppress a lot, this, so it wouldn't be the main bottleneck. And we can, of course, go and understand in, in general terms which phase should be optimal and how many throttle steps we need to apply. Finally, the error mitigation happens uh, as follows. I simulate the dynamics assuming that th there is noise. For instance, there is dephasing. And instead of um, how it's done in the variational circuit, sometimes people say, OK, I just flip some bits or apply operation. Here I use a technique which is very physically motivated, which is very function Monte Carlo. It's shown to uh, converge to density matrix approaches with some dephasing. And I deliberately use dephasing, which is very large. So actually, the coupling terms in the Hamiltonian, uh, its norm, its, its average is just five times bigger than the noise. So you can see it's very difficult to estimate the overlap. However, by extrapolating from large noise values to s small noise values and using uh, some techniques, so two different estimates, I managed to push down the boundary. So from noiseless level, the error mitigation allows to improve it uh, just a bit. It won't work at a large k, but if I consider the noise levels, which will be at least the uh, order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude smaller, then it will be possible to, wait a second, it will be possible to push it uh, down further. Finally, uh, that was molecular hydrogen. What's about larger system sizes, beryllium hydrate? The answer is yes, you can do it. So yeah, ideal inverse will give you actually quite good conversions because hard refox solution is efficient in this case. But of course, you will need to increase the maximal propagation phase to achieve uh, ground state precision, which is very expectable because by looking at the Hamiltonian and analyzing the, the properties, you can relate it to how many steps you need for uh, inverse iteration. So the simple outcome, it works. Now I come to the final part of my talk, which I consider one of the most important, which is, okay, before it was a benchmarking, trying something which people did. Now we can ask where it really will be a given advantage. And I would claim that it will be material science and uh, some models which already have analog quantum simulation in it. For instance, uh, Bose Hubbard model, that will be the simplest example. So we have some lattice, and uh, we have hopping terms, so uh, atoms can tunnel on the lattice. There will be on-site interaction, you, and I will concentrate now on 1D example, although 2D will be uh, much more interesting. And in 1D, this model has a superfluid to mount insulator transition. So if we take U, which is very large, and tunnel it is suppressed, the ground state will correspond to some trivial product states. And we, will, we can take it, let's say, uh, on average one uh, particle at the side. So that will be just a product state. If we increase J, it, if we increase tunneling, now the particles will start to delocalize. And at J, which is actually not even equal to you, but much smaller to you, depending on the uh, chemical uh, potential, it can be 10 times smaller than you, we will have superfluid phase. And now I'd, I would like to test it, how inverse iteration will work for the system. So this is the, the sketch of Bose -Hub Hubbard simulator. And for the Hamiltonian, where J is much smaller than U, so equal to 0 0.01, starting from the product state where we have particle at each side. The energy difference uh, is uh, quite large. OK, it's not so large, but it has very nice convergence to the ground state with iteration step. We go 10 to minus 8 in the units of U close to the ground state. Now I try to increase the, uh, the tunneling and ask what happens if actually my initial state is a product state, but I go all the way to the 
j over u 0.1 0.2 that's already the superfluid regime and you can see that okay convergence is not as steep but we do come closer to to the ground state so from something which was completely different to something which resembles a ground state now it's not only about the energy it's about the properties of the system so if i measure the correlation between uh, the side so there will be on side correlation and then let's say up to two sides that's that's what i calculated we can see that in mot insulator regime we start some somewhat close so this uh, lines may be a bit not visible but i will point it and we go all the way to this blue dots which are correlations in the mot insulator which decay rapidly now if we increase j in both cases we see that we start with the same correlations which basically uh, does not e exist and then with each iteration we improve this correlation which is even more evidence here so we go from k1 to k10 and almost recover this uh, spread of correlations in the superfluid regime although we started from something very different so this give me, uh, gives me possibility to think that if we have all the ingredients right and even if we don't start with uh, ideal uh, hard refox solution and something qualitatively different we can still uh, effectively lower the temperature and study uh, ground state properties and uh, originally when I, uh, I posted uh, the archive there was similar um, development by Marcus Greiner group so it was with Patrick Hayden on Siri site where they did swap test measurement to lower the temperature of the system and the idea is as follows you have two copies of the system and doing some collective measurement on two copies is like to have a single copy with twice lower temperature and their idea is this algorithmic uh, virtual cooling is if you have many many copies and do some complicated measurements uh, you actually go n times you decrease the temperature and this is pretty much the same technique because it requires the measurement of overlap which they did in this uh, PRX so it was Bose Hubbard model I guess it's just four sides but still it's possible to, to do these measurements and they've shown the decrease of temperature so with dynamics I would say you use extra resource of propagation the state you get something about the, the properties so instead of just lowering the temperature you can really reach the ground state finally the big motivation comes from this paper also from uh, two weeks ago analog quantum simulation uh, of chemistry which was ongoing development uh, for for years and finally uh, when it was uh, appeared on archive I said okay that's that's a great example uh, where you can implement actually the Hamiltonian hopefully for some uh, chemical system and you also so you don't need to trotterize the dynamics do some measurements and uh, get to the ground state physics and here I should of course uh, say we heard the beautiful talk but professor of Mori where you actually have uh, 3d fer uh, fermions with coulomb interactions that's exactly the ingredient we need to for chemistry so if you can implement this physically if you can propagate the state it, and you can come up with the good ideas how you measure it this can be seen as a quantum software for analog simulators because maybe you cannot do some uh, concrete gates but there are different strategies and the example I show is not the unique I also know other strategies which uh, which can help where just by propagating the state and measurement you can reach the ground state finally the conclusions are that we need to think about algorithm for NISC devices because that's what we will have for another 20 years I don't know correct me if I'm wrong but it's I would say for a long time and inverse iteration is just the first step how you can uh, do it with uh, analog quantum simulators and let's say less powerful quantum computers the dynamics here 
is the major resource, if you can propagate the state, you actually win and know not on the ground state, you can also reach the excited state properties. And in future, if we will have powerful analog simulators for fermions, that will be great because we will have also the software to run in these platforms. And following our discussion for entire week, I would ask, is it the good way to reach quantum advantage? Because maybe you, with simulators, it wouldn't be possible to show supremacy. So you will have some system, you will do some measurements. Maybe you fail in, uh, sometimes. Yes, it's difficult to certify. But if you predict something useful and go check it in the lab in, in vivo and it works, yes, that, that will be the quantum advantage. Thank you for attention. Do we need or? <laughs> Say it again. So there is no upper bound, of course, there, is, there are certain requirements formal on, on this. So first of all, the iteration step K will be a polynomial in so-called uh, coordination and... Wait a second. So essentially, if you have some metrics for inverse iteration to work, you shouldn't have uh, dominant and subdominant uh, eigenvalues which are too close. Because then it's like to say that you, you have, uh, you divide by zero. So H should have some properties. And usually you would also need to shift it by the constant. If you, uh, if you do the analysis, you would need to shift your uh, energies such that they are positive and inverse iteration gives a meaningful result. So that's, that's one point to consider. Second, you also need uh, overlap with initial state. If you, start, uh, if you start with initial state, which is completely orthogonal to your ground state, no matter how you act with these operators, you will never reach it which is, again, the assumption you have in quantum phase estimation. And we know that uh, quantum chemistry is QMA complete just because if you don't know anything about your Hamiltonian and you randomly pick a state and it's uh, exponentially far away from your ground state, you will need this exponential resource to distill this tiny part of the ground state. So I, I see it if you have large state and many possibilities and you want to find the tiny part of it, it's like you uh, skim away all the rest and, and search for it. So yes, you will need some overlap with the ground state, which is in quantum chemistry, you can motivate that usually it will be the case. Uh, because if you look at this uh, form of the Hamiltonian, it's rather innocent on, on paper. But in reality, you have all to all interacting fermions with Coulomb and with certain weights. Yes. And it's because of the, uh, of the range of the Hamiltonian, but also, even if it's, uh, it will be, in fermionic language, it could be something less complex. But how do you simulate fermions on the lattice of qubits? You need to do some transformation. And jordan Wigner transformation will take the local term and convert it into something non-local, because that's how you account for um, Pauli exclusion principle and anti-symmetrization of wave function. And then uh, general belief is that bravi Kitaev transformation will help. But okay, I tried it for uh, different molecules, even of increasing size, 
Brawe Kitaev didn't help to uh, reduce the, the loc to improve the locality, to reduce the range. It changes a bit the weights, but to see that it helps, maybe you need, uh, I don't know, 100 orbitals or more. So now the conclusion in quantum chemistry field is that we need to deal with Jordan Wigner, which means we need to have terms in the Hamiltonian which couple all hundred of spins. And this is terribly difficult. I mean, you can do the composition, but it's terribly difficult. Here you already have it. And if you have it naturally in your system, okay, it's, it's coming closer to actually simulating uh, the uh, chemi uh, chemistry with some another uh, well-controlled setup, but maybe that's what it takes. If you, so first of all, the trotterization part is exactly the same as if you, if you would do any other protocols like quantum phase uh, estimation or even QAA. You, you, if you want to encode the Hamiltonian, so this trotterization will be a necessary evil. You can do something else in trotterization, for instance, uh, do Taylor expansion of your uh, evolution operator and do it differently. It will be algorithmic improvement, but no matter what you do, the outcome is you cannot do it in fault tolerant un until you have fault tolerant way. And okay, if you say that uh, without this tertiarization, maybe you can try to achieve it with VQE. Or you don't also have uh, the the algorithmic evidence that you will actually reach it because at certain points the, the variation might just stop. So he, that's why it, the, the motivation is not to do trotterization, not to come up with uh, the ways how you like digitally compose the Hamiltonian, but to try to implement it in practice. So yeah, here I use the dephasing. So you, you consider that you have set of qubits and you have uh, dephasing noise in each of the qubits. I guess it might be even easier if you have amplitude damping, but yeah, you, you cannot uh, analyze everything as a well, so yeah, so this. Other questions? And so, not yet. I, I have tried the, the Bose Hubbard Hamiltonian because uh, yeah, referees always ask uh, questions: How do you actually do? What what's about rotorization? And this is a, a good example. And talking to Marcus Greiner, he said, "Okay, we cannot uh, do Fermi Hubbard uh, interference yet. So they they planning to do, but it's not yet there." But Bose Hubbard we can do. And uh, here it was the preliminary check. Of course, you can ask the question, what about if measurement goes wrong? I didn't account for it. So it, if you cannot do high fidelity measurement, of course, it will be difficult to achieve. But the example I shown here with uh, noise, even if it's very large, tells that you can still because you have many terms, and even if you have one mistake here, one mistake there, they will cancel out sometimes. So usually the achieving the chemical precision in this a, a case is uh, easier, and I would say for Bose-Hubbard it should be something similar. 